Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. There is a car salesperson named Doug in North Carolina. He makes his very successful living using his phone. That's not to make phone calls, by the way, though he does that. He uses his phone to do video text messaging. And Doug has figured it out. He is separating. He is iconic. And he is killing it. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shore. Well, welcome everyone once again to The Buyer's Mind. Jeff Shore here, your host of the podcast, where we try and figure out how to separate from everybody else by truly understanding your customer. And today, looking at it and saying, how do you figure out how to come up with a truly great experience? Not one that is simply distinctive, but one that is iconic. And our show producer, Paul Murphy, is with us. Murph, you heard me talking about Doug and what he's doing. Here's the question. Why? Why is he killing it? Why is Doug so successful? Well, I'm not one of his customers, but I would venture to say he's making it personal. You know, getting mm-hmm. getting uh, getting personal with his customers and really uh, getting into their lives and getting to know who they are. Absolutely. And he's doing something that clearly, clearly stands out. Uh, I look at something like video text messaging or video emails. And uh, to me, th- this sh- this should not be cutting edge. This should be as normal as the sunrise for a salesperson. But so few people are doing it. And yet, here's what Doug has figured out. What he's talking about with video text messaging, it's free. It came with the phone. Secondly, it's easy. Once you figure out how to do it, it's a snap. You can do it in a matter of seconds. Third, it's high impact because it's personalized. That's what Murph was just talking about. It's personalized. Fourth, it's totally unique because nobody else is doing it. And fifth, it's really enjoyable for the customer. Now, that is a potent combination which begs the question, well, why isn't everyone doing it? Why is everyone doing what everyone else is doing? And there's an answer to that question, because everyone else is busy being everyone else. You see, here's the problem. If you want to stand out a little bit, it does take some effort. And we are victimized oftentimes by our own brains. We're always looking for the easiest way to do something. And what we have figured out here is the easiest way to do something is to simply do what everybody else has already done. And the problem is that niche has been filled and your customer knows it so they get the same experience over and over again, and it is no fun. I want to recommend here to you that as we get into our discussion today with Scott McCain, that you're asking yourself the question, what can you do that is high impact, that is personalized, and that causes you to stand out? Well, I am thrilled to welcome one of the really the most influential business thinkers in the world today, and he has the resume to back that up. Uh, His new book is uh, just released. It's called Iconic, How Organizations and Leaders Attain, Sustain, and Regain the Highest Level of Distinction. Joining us from Las Vegas, Scott McCain. Scott, how are you, sir? It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me. Uh, like you, um, you know, I'm constantly uh, bemoaning the fact of the similarities, the sameness that we that we see out there with people who are uh, basically copycats of everything that that uh, that they're seeing. And I'm asking myself the question: You know, who does stand out? Who stands out in my life? What companies stand out? And you're you're I completely agree with you. The idea that um, if you are uh, truly distinctive, they're going to find you, and that's that's what you want to do. You want to be so good that you can't be ignored, right? That's the idea. That's that's yeah, a, yeah. that's a great story. Steve Martin line. Yeah, exactly. You know, the first time I heard that was Steve Martin uh, saying uh, when, when people ask him, you know, how do you become successful? He he said, really, what they're asking me is how do we become famous? Mm-hmm. And he said, I always give the same answer: be so good at what you do, you're impossible to be ignored. And and that's what so few people whether it's in sales or speaking or, or any industry, that's what so few people are really unwilling to put in the hard work to do is to really become that good because to be that good at something, you have to be willing to be bad at something. I mean, 
Jim, I am so glad that they're, you know, the, the, the camera and video were not as prevalent when I was making my first sales calls <laughs> because <laughs> God forbid any of that would get out. Right. right? Yeah. But, but you have to be bad at something before you can be good at something. You know, when I first started to attend uh, NSA National Speaker Association conventions, I think I went to my first one, oh, I don't know, it was 12 years ago or so. And uh, everybody kept saying the same thing. Everybody's giving me the same advice, right? Uh, you, the first thing you got to do is you got to be great from the platform. You have to have a great speech, and that's going to require a lot of work and hours and hours of rehearsal. And I remember just thinking to myself at the time, yeah, 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 I already know how to speak. Uh, what I need is to get connected with the speakers bureau who will book me full time. That's what I need. And right. uh, I, I was just so naive looking back at it at the time, how, how, how hard it was to be distinctive, to be iconic. And that's what I want to just chat about here next is that it's one thing to have a mindset of distinction but or, or of being iconic, but the actual execution takes a lot of work. And, and in your book, you've looked at it and said, here are four cornerstones of distinction. Let's get into that because it's not enough. To, we, we don't want a pep talk here, right? We have to be able to look at it and say, if you can't look at these four things and you really want to consider whether you want to go on this journey at all. Yeah, you, exactly. And and the first of the four cornerstones is clarity. And mm -hmm. it, it's something I know that you've talked a lot about previously here. You know, it's 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 being so clear and so simple, if you will, about what you do that that it's it's a laser focus. Uh, you, you, I heard you talking about you know the the confused mind never buys, mm -hmm. and my take on that too is that you know mind share precedes market share. If we can't get people thinking about what we're selling, they're not going to be buying what we're selling. So every sales professional and every organization wants to enhance market share. But, but that's, and that's important, but it's not the right place to start. Where we start is mind share. And, and mind share isn't created with a muddled message. You have to be so precise and so clear. And in the new book, one of the things I'm talking about there is that, you know, even great companies are making mistakes about this. Um, Apple, to me, their, their, their aspect is, you know, easy to use. But, but I think that they see their message as the highest technology. Well, now I have an Apple Watch that I don't know if I push the crystal down or twist the stem or push the button or swipe left, swipe right. Mm -hmm. You know, where where in the Steve Jobs days it was just there's one button right yeah. here, one thing, and and so the, the the clarity and the simplicity and that focus that is the first cornerstone of distinction. That is the first thing that you do to separate yourself in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and by the way, I I had an Apple Watch for a month. <laughs> yeah, for a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. All right. So, so the first is clarity. Then, then what comes next? Uh, second is creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and and one of the interesting things in, in the research for the uh, Create Distinction book um, was that my my assumption prior to writing it was that creativity would come first. That's how you stood out. Is that you were creative, and the research didn't support that. It's that you get clear first. And then within those boundaries, you get creative. We're, we're always hearing to think outside the box. Well, the problem is we really haven't defined the box precisely enough to begin with. And, and so if you look at, for example, songwriters, songwriters have to be clear before they can get creative. They got to decide, is this up-tempo or is it a ballad? Is it going to be some uh, male, female, or group? Is it going to be a rock song, a country song? What's it going to, and it, it's not until you get, get clear about what you're writing that you can get creative in what you write. And, and the same is true in business. We have to be very clear first, and then we only need to find one thing to make our business stand out. Mm -hmm. I mean, enterprise rental car rents the same Fords and Chevys as Hertz does. But when they said, oh, we'll pick you up, that one change created the, the, the biggest rental car agency in the world. So you don't have to do everything differently. Find, find one thing that you can do creatively in how you deliver, how you perform, what you do, and, and it will help you create distinction. In uh, at Charleston, one of my favorite cities, uh, Market Street Suites, a uh, candy store that sells, of course, pralines because it's uh, uh, Charleston. Uh, but when you walk down the street, you can hear them be before you can uh, actually see them. Yeah. But they hire people who work at the front register who like to rhyme or sort of 
minor league rapping. They they like to. So what, what do you call it? Freestyling? I don't know what they call what the yeah. kids call it these days. Uh, but th they just love to do it anyway. So they say, great, do it and sell sell candy at the same time. And the experience is just magical. I mean, it really, really is. You're just it's part of a show, and you're asking people to do what they want to do. And nobody nobody wants to just right. stand behind the counter and sell candy. They they want to have a little fun with it. Absolutely. And and that little twist on creativity got it discussed right here, right now. Absolutely. Right. And and so I'm thinking the next time I go to Charleston, I, I gotta seek this place out, right? right? Because it's attracting me as a customer. Yes. Uh rather than, than than selling me as a customer. Uh one of the interesting things about the new book uh is that one of the chapters there is that one of the factors of iconic performance is stop selling. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, in other words, I don't I obviously every organization has to uh close on transactions. Right. But but selling in terms of pushing and twisting mm -hmm. and 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 that because I, I respectfully disagree with a, a guest you've had previously here on this podcast and I think that sales has changed a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean we can look at it like cars haven't changed; they still get us to where we want to go. But but no one can say the car of today and the car that we see coming down the road in terms of autonomous driving is the same as the car that Henry Ford mm -hmm. created. Customers have more information than they've ever had before. Certainly. There's more competition than there's ever been before because, you know, I, I can buy hardware at your store or I can go online and order. I mean, there's more, the, co the competitive situation has changed exponentially. The amount of information customers have has changed exponentially. So how do we do that? How do we thrive in a world like that? Part of what we have to do is to come up with these creative solutions that, that attract customers and, and, and stop trying so much to, to browbeat them into, into buying. Uh, th th there was an article on Medium, uh, the, the, the website, last week about a, a woman that was uh, in an audience where a sales speaker came on, and his speech was, it doesn't matter if the customer hates you, just keep closing them until they give up. <sighs> and I, I, me too. I mean, <laughs> man, my gut just, and, and interestingly enough, and I think this is a, a, an incredibly positive sign. So many people complain that the CEO came out at the end of the conference and apologized for that viewpoint being presented from the stage. Good. Oh. I'm, I, I am on a mission to er eradicate the world of those types. It just drives me nuts. I love. I, I, I hate that that's still out there being expressed, but I love it that it's gotten to the point that sales professionals will complain to CEOs. Yeah, yeah. To the Right yeah. to the to the point that that because that's what we've got to get away from. Sure, sure. You know? All right, you talked about clarity. You talked about creativity. What comes next? A third is is communication, and it's it's how do we you know everybody talks about communication, but 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 here what the the twist on this is that there are more generations in the workforce, which means there are more generations that we need to sell to, and and they're seeking our products and services than ever before. So how do we communicate across such a wide expanse of generations? And what I'm suggesting is that it's done through narrative. It's telling a great story. Um, I'll ask audiences, Jeff, uh, by show of hands, how many of you have a Netflix subscription? Mm -hmm. And like every hand in the room goes up. Sure. And, and so my line is, so you know what I'm talking about when I say, uh, it's only 10 o'clock, we can watch one more. <laughs> <laughs> because we we are story junkies mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if you're a baby boomer or a millennial we love narrative we love stories and and for some reason we will sit at home at night and and watch these netflix series and get you know get hooked on them and then we go to work and we want to tell you about features and benefits without telling you a narrative a story about how this helped some customer or a narrative about here's here's the history of our company, which is why we're always going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we we thrill in the stories of Apple and Southwest Airlines, but we don't even tell our own story. And and everybody has that within them. There is a story there somewhere. And 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 that needs to be told. Clarity, creativity, communication. What's the fourth cornerstone of distinction for for being iconic? Fourth and final one is a customer experience focus. It, it is being obsessed with what does it feel like to do business with us. And, and it's, I, I was real careful with the words there, Jeff, because uh, we hear a lot about customer focus, mm -hmm. but, but this is a customer experience focus. It's taking it to the level that we are obsessed with what does it feel like to do business with us? And how do we increase the connectivity? How do we increase the emotional connection? And emotion is not a word we talk 
historically that we've talked a whole lot about, uh, but, but it is probably the most critical word I think today in terms of sales, is it how do we create emotional connectivity? The reason for that too, that's often overlooked is why would I be loyal to something toward which I have no feeling? Mm -hmm. it, it, I have to have feeling for loyalty to happen. I have to have some kind of emotional connectivity and feeling for referrals to happen. So for all of those basic things we talked about in selling uh, of, of repeat and referral business, sometimes what we've overlooked is the critical aspect of the emotional connection there. Because, you know, I had somebody tell me a while back, well, you know, my customers are loyal, I got the cheapest price which means all I have to do to steal your customers is have a cheaper price. They're not loyal to you, they're mm -hmm. loyal to the price. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some other compelling reason that, that creates that, that connectivity other than price. And so those are the aspects that we have to focus on to, to really move it to, to the next level because you can't become iconic without first becoming distinctive, right? If I, if I don't stand out in my own field, then I'm not gonna have the opportunity to stand out across the board. And so that's the first pillar of becoming iconic is that we really have to achieve this level of distinction uh, with, within our own field, within our own business, before we can take it and become such a high level that we're an example through, throughout business as a whole. Clarity, creativity, communication, customer experience focus. Uh, there is a, uh, and, and you use that that word emotion there, which we certainly talk a lot about here in the buyer's mind. There's a corollary word um, called passion that uh, sort of serves as a as an umbrella to all of those things. And it's almost as if we have to look at it and say there's a, a little bit of a conflict in that there are businesses that are going to look at it and say, well, you know, we're 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 a business, you know, we're a business, right? And you just think of the word business, we tend to think of it in terms of, you know, cut and dry spreadsheets and return on investment and all of these things. Uh, but there's this sense of passion uh, that is sometimes in direct opposition to what we think of as traditional business that is absolutely necessary if you want to stand apart. And my suspicion is that uh, that word passion is not just something that you're going to talk about in the book, but it sounds like a little bit of a life motto as well. Yeah, you bet. I, I, I'm, I'm, I struggle with that sometimes, Jeff, to be to be candid in that if if you look up in the dictionary, uh, one of the definitions of passion is barely controllable emotion. Hmm. That, that's straight from the dictionary, mm -hmm. barely controllable emotion. So I, I don't I don't want it to be. And, and that's why I've chosen to use the word emotion rather than passion is I I, I know that it's hard for a lot of pe business people to grasp that word passion because of the quote unquote, barely controllable aspect of it. Um, but, but it's what it is, is, and, and, but what I come around to is, well, for me, that is what it is. It is, it is, I care so much. It's, it's deeper than mere emotion. And I, I have yet to find the, the, the right word that really gets at that. But, but in business, we like control, right? Which I think is part of the reason that so many people are reticent about the word passion. And and, and the other aspect I, I got to share, and, and, and our buddy Larry Wingett is the one that first illuminated this for me, is that um, we, we see so much in the marketplace about if you just follow your passion, you'll be successful. But yet we have all seen people that are passionately terrible mm -hmm. at what they do. <laughs> I mean, I'm passionate at basketball, but don't put me on the court for right. God's sakes. I'm awful, yeah, right? Yeah. So it, it, it is finding this way that we channel the passion that is within us in, in a way that we can control uh, our performance, which in turn will help us control the outcome. And so that deep-seated um, uh, caring and that deep-seated emotional connectivity I, I think is of fundamental importance in in, in what we do. Uh, one more quick thing, Jeff, that I, I, I point out in the new book is that we've we've heard a lot too about the why. You know, there's, there was a, a, a terrific book out there about finding your why. But, but I also want us to remember as sales professionals, the customers buy the how. Mm -hmm. they, they buy how we do things. Um, you know, I, the burgers at Shake Shack are amazing. I don't care why they make it. I just like how they do it. <laughs> and, and so as sales professionals, we can never let our personal why get confused with the customer's desire to, to learn how. Mm -hmm. And and that is something that we really have to approach. That's, that's part of what I learned about iconic organizations is that, you know, what, what, what they really focused on 
was was getting the perform the, the the congruency between the promise that they make to customers and how they deliver the performance to the customers so that the promise and performance were were attuned where they, they were congruent and they delivered exactly what they had promised the customer this is actually, I think, consistent with one of the tenets that we talk about here on The Buyer's Mind, that if if you know your customer well enough, then you can reverse engineer your sales presentation to make it easy for them to buy. In other words, it, it is about why, but it's about their why. Their why, yeah. your how. Right? That's the kind of the way that I see this, and I think that's consistent with what you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, it, it exactly is. I mean, you know, what, one of the examples of, of uh, the why company used was Apple, you know, Apple's why. And uh, Joe Calloway pointed out for me, you know, go, in, go into an Apple store and, and ask any, you know, employee at the Apple store, you know, about their why. And they'll say it's to pay off student loans. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's, awesome. It's not, you know, it's not this big esoteric organizational why. So at the end of the day, it, it, it's the why can get confused, but the how has to be delivered extraordinarily well. And, and there's something that you said that just really triggered. Uh, I, I want to amplify because it's so brilliant and important. The whole aspect of reverse engineering. And engineering is something that is done, you can be passionate about the process, but engineering really is an analytical, it is a, it is a thoughtful approach. And it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, that we get so busy just making those calls or doing what we need to do, that we haven't made the time to think about it and to analyze it and to say, okay, this is our customer, let's reverse engineer the process so that there is great congruency between A, what, what our product and service is with what the customer wants, and B, even greater congruency with what the process is to inform, to inspire, to compel, to persuade the customer that what we have is exactly right for them. And, and when we go through that, then, and, and, and you say this, I know, Jeff, you better than I, is the, the logical conclusion of the customer is to make the purchase when we do that properly and when we do that correctly. Mm -hmm. We don't have to use any magical closing techniques. We don't have to, you know, uh, twist their arm. We don't have to do any of these things that, that, that now they've read about as well, because it's all over the internet about, you know, there's even things online that you can see about how you, you know, how you handle uh, pushy salespeople. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, it, it, what we want to get is that a, there's a logical conclusion and that is to buy. And, and through that, the customer experience, and that's why the customer experience is so important too. I, man, I, in the early days, I did these sales training things just to get experience on the platform. And one of the things that said in that is service is the first step of the next sale. And I realized how wrong that was. I mean, it's the first step of the first sale. It, <laughs> why, why would I believe you're going to serve me after you sell me if you're not creating a, an experience before you sell me? Yeah. So all of this plays into this this approach to sales that, that I think you're right on target for and that you talk about here all the time and, and that we really need to be thinking about and approaching. Uh, to help us stand out in this very crowded competitive field. Before we let you go, let's put you on the hot seat. Uh, rapid fire questions, rapid fire answers. You ready? Yeah. You don't have a choice. You have to be ready. <laughs> 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 Your very first job was what? I, I back in groceries in my parents' grocery store, Love and I, I learned firsthand there about uh, the importance of customer service from from dad and and how he approached customers and and his basic approach is even if you bought a pack of gum, we'd offer to carry it out to the car for you. No, that's we, great. That's we, great. we can't compete with a supermarket, but we we can better them on on the customer experience. When you were ten, you thought you would be what? President. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the most beautiful place you've ever stood. Oh my gosh, I had a chance to speak in uh, Srinagar in India. And it is a place not many people go because mm -hmm. there's a high degree of terrorism there. It's and not, not directed towards Americans. Mm -hmm. It's it's on the India-Pakistani border. Mm -hmm. And it is, it, it's tragic what is happening there because it is the most beautiful spot that I've, I've ever stood in my life. Wow. Uh, any book that you've read that has made a profound impact on your life? Oh, gosh, anything and everything that uh, Zig Ziglar ever wrote. My hero. There you go. Uh, a movie you've seen multiple times, but you just can't help it. You have to watch when it comes on again. Tombstone. Okay. And finally, the name of your first celebrity crush. Oh, wow. That's a that's a great one. Uh, 
gosh, this dates me. But uh, when I was growing up was the heyday of Raquel Welch. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Wow. That's great. That's great. Uh, his name is Scott McCain. Uh, he is uh, sometimes referred to as the Scott McCain. <laughs> He's, <laughs> as you could have heard just from his resume, just extremely impressive. His impact on our society today is multidimensional and extremely profound. But as you can tell, he is a good guy. He is a good guy. And we're thrilled to have him on The Buyer's Mind. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. Jeff, it has been my thrill. I, I, I can't thank you enough. This has really been a privilege and just a joy. So thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate it. Well, there you go, Murph. Uh, part two of our conversation with uh, Scott McCain. I, I have to tell you, if nothing else, I mean, I love his message. I really do. But don't you just love his passion, his energy, his enthusiasm for life in general? Well, you don't get to be a part of the NSA without having that kind of energy, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's there's no question about it. And he is one of those guys whose reputation is rock solid. I mean, uh, you you mentioned Scott McCain at the NSA, and 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 it'll get people's attention. There's there's no question about it. But not just because he's a great speaker, although he is absolutely a world class speaker. He's just genuinely a good guy. I think we heard that on the podcast. We did, and uh, you know, he had a lot of great things to share both in part one and part two so mm -hmm. uh you know there's there's something if you didn't walk away with something out of uh, these two podcasts uh, i'd you, you've got nothing between your ears is all i'm saying <laughs> you know we we talk a lot about the customer's why about their motivation and and rightly so right if you understand the customer's motivation it changes everything but i loved his take to say essentially and, and i'm going to paraphrase his words here but it's your customer's why that matters. Not your why. It's the customer's why. What matters to your customer is your how. So here's my customer's why over here, and here is your how over here. That That's where those two things come together so absolutely beautifully. And when we look at great experiences that we have, they, we look and we say, you know, why am I even talking to you in the first place? What what problem do I have that I need to be solved? And what I'm interested in is not the why that you're in existence. I'm not interested in your mission statement, but I'm very, very interested in the way that you're going to take care of me and the way that you're going to solve my problem. And so the idea that engineering that customer experience is a really thoughtful approach. It's really based on how that customer wants to be treated in the first place. It, it's it's one of those things where if you want to stand out in the marketplace, you need to understand that that customer is on a very personal journey. They're interested in their why, but they're interested in your how. And I just want to encourage you to take some time to ask, what can you do that no one else is doing? What can you do that will cause you to stand out? But as you do that, I want you to think of it from the customer's perspective. So brainstorm a little bit and maybe get people together to have this group conversation. But look at it through the customer's eyes. If I was a customer, how impressed would I be with that idea? How impressed would I be with that execution at that level? That's the idea. If you want an example of this, think about if you've ever been to a Cirque du Soleil show, it's an amazing production. I mean, absolutely incredible. And it starts with audience interaction even before the curtain goes up. And then there's more audience interaction uh, during the show. It wraps you in. It involves you as a as sort of a co-participant. But you absolutely know that whoever, whoever is designing the show is looking at it and saying, not why do we do these things at Cirque du Soleil. The question is, how do we do these things in order to create this, this really amazing experience for our audience members? Um, this is sales and service as theater. How do you look at it along those lines? And, and there's one last thought that I want to plant in your brain, and that's to ask this question. What if your customer had to pay you $5 to go through your sales presentation? What value would you need to bring? How would you make that so interesting that they would be willing to pay you $5 to go through your presentation? Spend some time on that. Sit and brainstorm a little bit, because these are the ways that we stand out. These are the ways that we find ourselves not just to be distinctive, but iconic. These are the ways that we change our customers' world.